just the UK, but by April 2009 he was planning the most audacious operation yet, the takeover of the huge coal-fired power station at Ratcliffe on Soar. Mark Stone drove an advance party of campaigners in the pre-dawn. We spoke to an activist on the reconnaissance trip. It was on a dark morning almost two years ago today that Mark Stone drove myself and four other people who were investigating the possibilities of doing this action, drove us to this very spot and um, it was here that with his local knowledge he was able to give us uh, directions over to our targets over there. So he was playing a key role in this recce, wasn't he? He was driving, he was enabling us to get here, he was enabling us to get the footage and the, the things we needed to make the action happen and to plan the action. A few days before the planned takeover, campaigners noticed a heavy police presence outside the power station. In response to this we thought, maybe we've been found out, maybe this action can't take place right now, maybe we'll have to tell everyone to go home. And then Mark Stone uh, volunteered to go and check out the power station himself to go and see if anything had changed. He went to the power station, he came back and he told us the police had gone, the police have gone. You can go for it, go for the action, the police have gone. On the day before the proposed action, more than 100 climate campaigners arrived at this school hall to be briefed on the plan. They say some had decided to take part, others wanted to sleep on it. They bedded down on the floor around midnight. If you imagine the scene, um, there's 114 people um, in this school. Uh, we've just had a whole day of briefings and um, people are bedding down for the night. Some are getting ready to take action tomorrow. Um, others, like myself, still kind of mulling it over. Am I going to do it or not? And then at that very moment, suddenly, um, we hear banging on the door, um, then a smashing noise. The police are coming in. There's police vans parked all along this road and suddenly hundreds of police officers start pouring into the building and arresting everybody. We were actually being put into vans, taken away, put in a police cell, um, simply for being at a meeting. It's really, really bizarre. 26 people were eventually charged with conspiracy to trespass. Meanwhile, suspicions were focusing on Mark Stone, and those close to him discovered documents which gave his real name Mark Kennedy. And those documents, in turn, led to others which confirmed that he was a serving police officer. This, this isn't the kind of thing you expect when you're going to meetings, you're talking about climate change, you're, lots of people are really concerned about the environment and we're talking about organising some sit-ins and some protests and, you know, you don't, you don't think that at that, at that kind of level of organisation there's going to be someone in the room who is a, is a trusted activist um, who is actually secretly a police officer who's working against you. A climate campaigner traced Mark Kennedy down in November and asked him to call. He replied by email. Hi, I'm in a very bad way at the moment. I'm so distraught about what has happened. I know you as a great guy. I'm very much alone and don't know where to turn. I see opportunities to do right, but don't know where to take them. He claimed he'd left the police, writing, I'm not in the police, so I can talk to who I want. Be aware, though, my communications are likely being monitored, which is ironic, hence email is safer. But PC Mark Kennedy apparently felt so guilty that he telephoned the protester who recorded the conversation, and these are the tapes. I owe it to a lot of good people to, to do something right for a change. It really hurts. I'm really sorry. Some of those charged with conspiracy to trespass argued there could not have been any conspiracy because there was no agreement to take action. People were still thinking about it in the school hall. Mark Stone appears here to agree. No, yeah, let's, let's think about it. I mean, yeah, there's no. Uh, like, I mean, for me, like, there's no massive rush. I mean, to be honest, what what you're saying is exactly the case. After Mark Stone's activist friends outed him in Nottingham, the solicitor for some of those accused saw this as a potential line of defence and immediately applied for full disclosure about Mark Stone's role. Now, we're told that the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, initially declined to give any such disclosure but then faced with a formal court application just last week, folded the case. And today, as expected, the trial collapsed. No evidence was put forward against the six men. The CPS have issued some kind of statement suggesting that the existence of an undercover officer was not in any way linked to their decision not to proceed. What's, what do you make of that? 
I find this very surprising, actually. Surprising because, first, they haven't told us what the evidence was. Second, it's an enormous coincidence that, at the same time that we ask for an application to be heard by a trial judge, that this material will be disclosed to us, the prosecution, like a click of their fingers, dropped the case. I would argue it was about intelligence gathering. I would suggest it was about trying to physically stop the climate movement, who they were scared were getting too powerful. But this certainly wasn't about protecting the public. There seems to be this very, very strange idea that it's important to throw huge amounts of resources and very dubious, dangerous and worrying tactics to try to silence protesters. Perhaps the most alarming fact for the campaigners is that Mark Kennedy seemed to confirm there are other police moles in the protest movement. I'm not the only one, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I mean... Not, not by a long shot. I'm not the only one. And, yeah, it's like a hammer to crack them up. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's fun in all different ways, and there'll always be justification, but, you know, and then you start looking at the way that the, the law is used and it's manipulated, and it's you just think, like, what the fuck? The Metropolitan Police refused to confirm or deny whether Mark Stone was an undercover officer but pressure is mounting. Tonight, Nottinghamshire Police announced they're asking the Independent Police Complaints Commission to investigate the collapse of the case, and a separate inquiry into the conduct of the undercover operation is also being discussed. Richard Watson, well, we asked the Crown Prosecution Service and the police for interviews to discuss the implications of our case, the case, but our requests were declined. I'm joined here in the studio by Sophie Stevens, who was initially arrested by the police in connection with this case, but was never charged. Also here is the former police officer, Peter Blexley, one of the founding members of Scotland's Yard's undercover unit, and Laura MacDonald, the former director of public prosecutions. Uh, Sophie, first, how did you know Mark Kennedy? I started to get involved in the environmental social justice movement about seven years ago, which, as I understand it, is about the same time that Mark Stone or Kennedy also started to get involved. So almost every major political action or protest that I was on, he was there somewhere. Um, I was first introduced to him as Transport Mark, um, and he was always responsible for, for driving, for organising transport, for hiring vehicles. Um, I was surprised that it was him, but uh, tragically, I'm not surprised that there were undercover police officers in the movement. Was he at Glen Eagles? Because it was some Dubai. Yes, he, he was he at Glen Eagles. Absolutely, he was at Glen Eagles. But what do, I've but, discovered. Do you, think, do you think that he, just looking at the way he operated, do you think he was a camp follower or an agent provocateur? I think that's a difficult call to make. I think that he was. I think that the example that was given was very interesting because I was in a vehicle going down to the action at Nottingham and we received a telephone call to say that there were police cars outside the power station that we were, not, we were considering calling off the action and we were ready to go home. It was only because Mark Stone or Kennedy drove past and said that there were no cars there that the, actually the action continued. And I think that that was a decision, because if the police had wanted to prevent that action from happening, they could have easily mm. arre arrested a small group of people and saved huge amounts of money weeks or months before, because he was in that core group. But they decided to leave it to arrest 114 people because they wanted, I believe, to police politically and to try and damage a protest movement. Because if you arrest that number of people, even if you only charge 26, you put that large number on bail and that pre prevents them from being involved in protest, and that is political policing. Now, you are a, an undercover cop aware of long-standing. Do you think that's how undercover officers should behave? Well, I, I think there's a large question about proportionality here. You know, was this the only tactic that the police could use to gain the information they wanted? He said sledgehammer to crack a nut, and he indicated there were other officers involved in the environmental movement. Do you think that's likely? That's absolutely true, and there are also undercover people from the private security sector working against climate campaigners, um, and, and, and so it goes on. But from your own experience, I mean, I take it you were never undercover in one operation for seven years, a long, long time. No, I wasn't, and I was never undercover against climate uh, campaigners because my senior management at the time 
would have regarded me as too important a resource to be deployed against people that they would have regarded as fluffy tree huggers. But do you, do you uh, understand the mo model when you look at his own case that he possibly did have Stockholm Syndrome, that he probably did switch sides? Absolutely, and I think part of the problem that's arisen here is that there may not have been clearly defined goals, mm -hmm. that this operation may just have kind of dragged on and on and morphed from one aim to another and the best undercover operations are those that are clearly targeted with clearly achievable goals. Lord Madon, these are fluffy tree huggers. What Sophie said was, you know, over a hundred people arrested. Disproportionate? Well, I wouldn't describe them in that way, but they're not world-class criminals, that's for sure. They're not terrorists. They're not criminals at all. They're not, well, uh, the, the, these ones clearly aren't the ones who, who have been acquitted. I mean, some have pleaded guilty, but the point I'm making is this is not serious, outrageous, dangerous crime that threatens the state. Now, what we're talking about here is a long-term police operation, seven years. On your watch? One individual. On well, the Labour government, under, you know, well, I'm, 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 you're independent. I'm not associated with the Labour no. government. We're talking about a long-term police operation, a, a single officer, mm -hmm embedded for seven years that this is not a terrorist organization I, I, I do think there is as, as you said a serious question of proportionality here. But is there not also a serious question about the rule of law because there's evidence collected that was inadmissible in court. I mean, we're having all this row about control orders. And well, this is, the, this is the problem, isn't it? it, it, it it's fine to have uh, police officers embedded in criminal organizations, and undercover police work detects an enormous amount of crime and brings people to justice. But it has to be done in a way which obtains admissible evidence for court. And the, the real question that arises here, we've just heard the tapes, is whether this man was ever going to be capable of developing admissible evidence for the prosecution but to use in court. But he was there for seven years and he has presumably been involved in previous um, incidents where cases were brought to court. So we don't know actually already. Well, I don't know if what some he was people doing. have been actually found guilty on his evidence which was inadmissible in well, court. Well, no, but he, I mean, if he's given evidence in the past, no, that yeah. it wouldn't necessarily be inadmissible. The point is he's been involved well, he in this operation for seven years against people like this, this, this young woman over here. And it, one, one has to ask, really, are, is, is this an appropriate use of resources, essentially? But also, is this how a modern democracy should operate? Well, I don't think there's an objection intrinsically to undercover policing. Undercover policing is a valuable tool which, as I said, brings serious criminals to justice. The question is whether this sort of activity, I don't think it's tree-hugging, I think these are people who have a serious uh, issue of conscience which they're acting upon, whether that sort of activity really requires the sort of state intervention mm. which this man's behaviour represents. Well, why do you think there has been this level of state intervention, Sophie? I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's because the police police politically. And I think that I said earlier that I wasn't surprised that we had un un an undercover policeman in our movement, not because of actions that we have taken, but because from my experiences, unfortunately, I know that we are much further along the road towards having a police force that polices politically and defends the interests of corporations. And that's a really, really dangerous road to go down, and we're much further down it than we like to believe. And do you think, if, that, if, if, Sof if Sophie's argument is correct, then that police officers feel they should be used for such an endeavour? Well, yes, I think, I think a large part of what Sophie says cuts to the very core of the matter. This is about finance. Mm. Because, so should the police be involved at all? Well, that's a very good question, and we know from recent reports conducted by the police's own inspectorate mm -hmm. that there are huge failings with regards to their policing of public order events. Mm -hmm. You've also got the situation where people in the are saying, you know, we've got scant resources. You know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, we don't know, is devoted to undercover operations. Perhaps some of it is organised crime, obviously, some of it is terrorism, but some, but some of it is on environmental campaigns. You know, people must wonder if that is a good use of their money. I think people will, will ask that question. I think people will look at the tapes you've played and listen to the, the evidence and ask themselves whether we really need to be paying for someone like Mark to be pretending to be an environmental uh, uh, professor and, for and, seven and, years. And is there a danger that it is seen as political for the very reasons that Sophie Well, I think there is a real risk of that because someone is making the decision about where their financial priorities lie um, and the, the decision, this particular decision seems a little bizarre and people will, will ask questions about how, how it was arrived at. Now, just going back to, uh, before we finish to Mark Kennedy himself, I mean, from these tapes he sounds a bit like a broken man but I mean, he went so far as having another relationship, embedding himself so far that presumably he, he was reading a very schizophrenic existence. Yes, indeed, and that's 
the undercover policing is littered with tales of broken careers, mm. fractured lives. Mm. At one point, I was one of them. Mm. Um, undercover policing puts unique strains. Did you strains. get too close sometimes? Um, yes, I think that that's a fair mm. comment. Uh, and there was a lot of there was a lot of pressures. You know, there was organised crime gangs trying to kill me, and I had to live in the witness protection mm. program, and all those kind of, of of added pressures. He will be in a very lonely place now. His former colleagues will shun him. I'm sure that Sophie mm. and her friends will shun him as well. Would you forgive him, Sophie? Do you think? Forgive him? Goodness me. That's a question. I don't think we can really trust anything he says right now. I think it's really difficult. But uh, I do think that we have to be clear that this isn't just in isolation. There's all sorts of political policing that's happening in the UK. And it's really damaging and undermines democracy. Thank you all very much indeed.